Hi there, I'm Eric Angus McRae, founder of the Scarborough-based project called The Truth Crusade. And tonight I wish to speak a bit about Black Lives Matter in response to a recent video that went viral in which the co-founder of the Black Lives Matter movement confessed that they have a Marxist ideological framework. And I'll show a clip of the video in the movement my first issue of concern that I would like to address to the general African American and African Canadian societies um, is the deep concern that there is a general lack of education on what it means to be a Marxist or what is Marxism in the modern Western vernacular. And that I'm not referring to in any way um, purely the African uh, communities here, um, especially really anybody who grew up in the public education system in the West that includes Caucasians and people of all races. Uh, there's probably a lot here you're not exposed to. Um, so first, let me pull up um, the general definition that most people are going to turn to. So when most people hear word in our modern time, they're going to do a Google search to pull up the first dictionary definition that comes. And there might be a lot of danger of that in some scenarios, but probably in the case of the word Marxist, it's, you're going to get a very honest result. So if you just Google search Marxist definition, this is the first thing that's going to come up. Um, so you'll under, be understanding a bit about what Patrice Cullors is saying. Um, Marxist, uh, noun definition, a supporter of the political and economic theories of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. Adjective, relating to or denoting the political and economic theories of Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And there might be various other terms. Um, another thing here, people ask, what is Marxism in simple terms? Uh, to define Marxism in simple terms, it's a political and economic theory where a society has no classes. Um, it's a, it, it's actually, that's not really a fully well-defined answer. It's a lot easier to just read the Communist Manifesto from uh, one of the famed documents really at referenced here. Um, first, I want to confirm that this is really what Patrice Cullors really said, and nobody's putting words in her mouth. So uh, you can see the video clip here quite clearly. Um, take a look. He was concerned or is concerned that, uh, that there's a lack of perhaps uh, uh, ideological direction in Black Lives Matter that would allow it to be, to, to, to fizzle out, in, as he said, um, uh, in comparison to Occupy Wall Street. Uh, as you are, are advanced in your own organization, as you all are headed to Cleveland to participate in this Black Lives um, Movement conference, how do you respond to that particular critique? Again, a loving critique from an elder of the struggle uh, that some others share, uh, that I've even shared as well, uh, to, to be frank, as a concern about, uh, in part because of the co-optation and, and the appropriation, that, that a, a more clear ideological um, structuring might be of some value here. But how do you respond to, to, to those kinds of, uh, again, loving criticisms? Um, I think that the criticism is helpful. Um, I also think that it might... Um, I think of a lot of things. The first thing I think is that we actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, we are uh, super uh, versed um, on sort of ideological theories. Wow, so very clearly, uh... Patrice Cullors is saying, and saying that Alicia with her, the, these founders of Black Lives Matter are trained organizers, trained Marxists. If you didn't catch it, uh, I'll play it one more time for you. But this is such a very important point that they've made. Let, let's hear that one more time. We actually do have an ideological frame. Um, myself 
and Alicia in particular are trained organizers. Um, we uh, are trained Marxists. Um, wow. Um, and the other key thing I think you really want to draw from this is the first term. We actually do have an ideological frame, and this is with clear reference to we are Marxists. And obviously by trained organizers, they don't mean just trained organizers uh, uh, moving people to a group. They're, this is with explicit reference to the ideology of Karl Marx, from whom the term Marxist and Marxism is drawn. Without a doubt, there's no denying it. All right, so let's examine now what this really means. Um, seeing that Patrice Cullors has confessed they, they do have this ideology. And as you see, uh, I gave you the general definition is, is referring to Friedrich Engels and Karl Marx. And I'm just going to grab some books here. Um, you're going to want to know that, that name and the literature associated with that name. Now, I want to be very clear and careful in expressing my concern to modern African Americans and African Canadians and who maybe grew up in the public school system around the same time I did. I went attended Lester B. Uh, Pearson Collegiate Institute. Um, from about 2004 to 2008 it was my high school time and I have a pretty clear memory of what I was taught there and what was not taught so I'm just going to use myself as an example and now I came from a uh, not a very well-to-do family at all and I'm still kind of in not in a well-to-do situation at all <laughs> in a manner of speech uh, I had a single mother background we always struggled to meet ends meet and um, we were really bottom of the barrel most of our payments went to rent and my mother always worked for really harsh wealthy bosses who never really seemed to be appreciative and kind of never seemed to really get anywhere financially uh, kind of family. So um, I remember um, communism and Marxism being loosely defined in my school system. And, and that's something you want to understand from the literature. Um, so this book here is called The Communist Manifesto. This book is authored by Karl Marx and Friedrich Engels. And you can see this Caucasian European man on the cover. Um, this is Karl Marx. Uh, it's a picture of Karl Marx. Um, and we'll get a bit into his history for a bit, but um, when people say Marxist, it is, you need to understand it is basically an interchangeable word in a synonymous term with a communist. And when they are referencing Friedrich and Engels, they are usually represent uh, referring to this collaborative work this, if you will, is the creedal document, the founding document of most contemporary communist movements, if you discern it as a particular form of socialism. Um, and that is something that is critically important that you understand when you're hearing uh, things like what Patrice Cullors said. Um, and my point is being that um, when I was in high school, uh, to people in my economic classification, um, families like mine, and especially even more so than mine to the African-Canadian community, for instance, um, which at the time was very immersed in this sort of hip-hop reggae uh, gangster rap culture where a lot of us are, they'd be coming from similar background, uh, single mother families, um, not stable homes really, ho households, low finances, all the same kind of problems, maybe exasperated a little worse for in the sense that um, uh, and I'm not referring to the other challenges that potentially exist in legal systems or anything of the sort, um, a little worse in the sense that there's a cultural backdrop there that 
makes it very awkward at times growing up in a, a, a nation with such a Caucasian history, for sure. In addition to that, you have the unique challenges of um, law enforcement and all that, and, and the challenges of the sort of lifestyles promoted and the battles going on there. I'm not going to speak with any issue of judgment on that right now. The point being is that for people in this economic classification where you feel like you, you can't advance and single mother household type of situation, communism was really promoted. And I definitely heard it promoted in my high school because I explicitly remember myself coming out of that high school thinking communism is a great thing for people like myself. It's this uh, system of fairness and equality and equalization and human rights and such a it looked it, it really seemed at the time to be so noble and and perfect in the way it was explicated uh, to me if, if that's the right word um, it was really explained as a system that's going to benefit somebody like me and give me that uh, and my family and give us that way out of poverty and more so for the um, African uh, Canadian and African American community. Unfortunately, we were not told all the facts in our high school, and this would have been self-evident now looking back that I came out saying communism's a great system. And I had, if you were to say, wow, you're familiar with the literature of Karl Marx, what do you think about the narrative of the bourgeoisie and the proletariat? I'd be like the 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 the, the bourgeois. <laughs> um, humor aside, I had never heard the terms bourgeoisie and proletariat. In our high school, this was roughly summarized in at least the applied courses and never really explained. Nobody really told us this document was never read to us. And I'm, I'm kind of glad it wasn't, to be honest, in retrospect, because I suspect most of our teachers were pro-Marxist and they probably would not have given us an honest reading of it or told us everything and the full truth in history. But I see a lot of problem with that. It is kind of like a Christian coming saying, I'm a Christian. Here's, here's the Bible. I've, I've never read it, though. I don't know what it asks me to do as a Christian. I don't even know what that means, but I'm a Christian. You get sort of the same kind of issue happening. Um, thankfully, this is a lot smaller book than the Bible. <laughs> and, and without a doubt, the this particular copy of the Communist Manifesto that you can get from Amazon is uh, about <laughs> 39 pages and with a big font too. Um, so I'm very thankful for that, but it's a lot more complicated than that. And, uh, and there's a lot more than meets the eye here. Um, nevertheless, if you're part of that culture, given the nature of Karl Marx and Marxism, and, which is synonymous with communism, it's not an insult. It's not a put down, it's not a racist commentary, but it's simply a fact that you are statistically in a group that is not likely to possess a high knowledge of Karl Marx. And why would you not possess that knowledge? For one reason, uh, for the same reason I did not, being a Caucasian, um, it was not spoken about in our public, uh, our public schools and excuse me, in public schools in Ontario, where I've got to be honest, a, a lot of U of T, uh, University of Toronto professors, they're obsessed with this literature. And that bleeds over into our public education system in powerful ways. Um, they're very pro-communist manifesto, and they don't openly confess that. So they don't let you hear the whole story. So that's the first part of the problem and the second part of the problem is the average African Canadian and African American has phenomenon like the Black History Month and that we look at black history and the subject matter of slavery of Africans and 
colonial abuses which are great and numerous and horrific and unfortunately the problem and the weakness of the term black history is that it's reactionary in nature it's reacting to abuses by empires associated with a high preference for Caucasian races whatever however you define that and unfortunately the African and Canadian and African American entity tends to react by going into a sort of turtle shell of document uh, of of history where it's only stuff relevant to black history of about the past 400 or 500 years and most of the characters talked about are black characters and most of the uh, Caucasian characters are really the um, the nemesis of the story and um, there might be a few Caucasians that are of course acknowledged as very helpful for the, the pro-abolitionist uh, Caucasians and the Underground Railroad, that would be spoken about, but the history, not only is it not going very far back in time, and I, I think that itself is dangerous because you African history is a lot longer than 500 years, and that's something that needs to be considered. Um, but apart from that, um, there are recent movements in European history, in locales that are generally seen as Caucasian, uh, generally seen as a Caucasian history that aren't really spoken about openly by most African American and African Canadian people who have not attended universities and stuff like University of Toronto and gotten PhDs and degrees. And that's also a problem because a lot of the professors are trained Marxist just like Patrice Cullors which means that when you go and learn from one they're looking to indoctrinate you into the system as a promoter of it and unfortunately you would not read it with a view to critiquing it or to having a critical examination of its principles so rest assured when Patrice Cullors says they have a Marxist framework, it means they have a agenda that is tied to the agenda of this document here. That's what that means. And if you do not know what this says, this communist manifesto, if you have no idea what it says or how to read it, you're in the dark and you're going to be very confused because you will find out as a African Canadian or African American that Black Lives Matter promotes a lot more than than um, racial equity. It promotes a lot more than overthrowing the evils of systemic racism and um, corrupt law enforcement and it's a very radical organization and I honestly confess you know I'm looking back and I remember at times being um, bullied and bullying others going through those sort of moments of development we all experience in the public school system which are pretty toxic at times and you know I remember the kind of names abuse names that those of the African Canadian gangster rap subculture would use to people they fought with or were looking to put down and I can tell you from what I recall hearing that the African gangster rap subculture which I am no promoter of gangster anything but these people are not a group with a high view to LGBTQ plus um, beliefs and lingos classically. So if people of that view are grabbing onto Black Lives Matter who is very pro that, 
already they would have noticed, well, something's kind of off about this because a lot of Africans and African Canadians will come up to you and say, well, I'm not about that. What is your message to Western human rights groups, to President Obama, respect to lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender re people? Respect African societies and their values. If you don't agree, you just keep quiet. Let's manage our society the way we see. If we are wrong, we shall find out by ourselves. Just the way we don't interfere with yours. Do you personally dislike homosexuals? Of course, they are disgusting. What, what, what sort of people are they? How can you go? Uh, I, I, don't, uh, I never knew what they were doing. That's how I've been told recently that uh, what they do is terrible, disgusting. But I was, I was ready to ignore that if there was proof that that's how he's born, ab abnormal. But now the proof is not there. One of the major issues, and it's a holdover from sort of colonial Victorian, is the issue of sexual preference in many African countries. In Kenya, to be gay, the LGBT community is, is illegal. They just want to have equal rights, the same privacy and equality as all other Kenyans do. Is that something that you aspire to for your country? I want to be very clear, uh, 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 there is. I will not engage in a subject that is of no, it's, uh, it, it is not of any major importance to the people and the Republic of Kenya. This is not an issue, as you would want to put it, of um, human rights or this. This is an issue of society, of our own base as a culture, as a people, regardless of which community you come from. This is not acceptable. This is not agreeable. This is not about Uhuru Kenyatta saying yes or no. This is an issue that the people of Kenya themselves, who have bestowed upon themselves a constitution, right, after several years, have clearly stated that this is not a subject that they are willing to engage in yeah, at this time and moment. In years to come, possibly long after I'm president, who knows? Maybe our society will have reached a stage where those are issues that people are willing freely and open to discuss. I have to be honest with you. And that is the position that we have always maintained. Those are the laws that we have. And those are laws that are 100% supported by 99% of the Kenyan people, irregardless of where they come from. So, I, I think it's a very you're going to get yourself into trouble. Mm. Because what you've categorically just stated is that this is not an issue for us, for the Kenyan people, yes. and you don't think that the idea of their privacy, their equality, their rights... Christian, is important, this is, uh, uh, but it's a global issue it's, right now. It's it's important to them where they are. Why is it I am important saying to you that it as is president not of the country? important to me as the leader of 49 million Kenyans. And after, if you want to ask me my personal opinion, what is your personal after opinion? After I finish my process, I can talk about my personal opinion. But as the leader of the people of the Republic of Kenya. I, I represent that which our people are desirous to be. And I have no choice, but that is my position. Would you publicly say that people who are LGBT, gay members of the Kenyan population should not be discriminated against, should not be violated, should not be abused? All, all, no Kenyan, no Kenyan should be abused, should be, you know, uh, uh, um, mistreated in any particular. Every Kenyan is protected by law, every single Kenyan. But they also must recognize that their freedoms are also must be taken into the entire context of the society that they live in. Because this is not a question of governments accepting or not accepting. This is a question of society. Right? Currently, Accepting. it's a legal process. Yes. And that legal process is based on the society that you live in, and that's why laws are made. 
So I think that's all I have to say about that particular thing. Part of it. I'm about racial equity. That part, that's not necessarily my agenda. Now, nobody here is saying that um, people practicing the homosexual lifestyle, for instance, should be lynched and stoned right now. That's not what this is about. But point being is that even in the African-Canadian and African-American subculture of that extreme element of the gangster rap subculture, they don't promote everything Black Lives Matter promotes, and this is probably the most radical group of them. And there are others. I mean, not everybody. Obviously, gangster rap subculture does not speak for African Americans and Canadians. Many of them would find it abhorrent um, as a criminal lifestyle and, and many and I think that's a fair criticism, uh, given the commonality of so much of that uh, rap trope to sing about, for example, calling women female dogs and basically tools to be mated with and for pleasure and um, promoting violence. A lot of them absolutely loathe that. So I'm not at all saying that's a rep representative of all, but already looking at that, that, that category, you see, there's just things that are not lining up. But if I look at the other layers of African Canadian and African American subculture, a lot of them don't like LGBTQ um, systems and language. That that's not. A lot of them do not see that as black sexuality, and I wouldn't like that term because I don't even see it as Caucasian sexuality. But that's. That's just an interesting discussion that comes up, and a lot of them will outright go and tell you this has nothing to do with us. I don't know why they're promoting this. I just want to be here to support my people with regards to first increasing knowledge of our history of abuses suffered under Caucasian empires and things alike, and um, uh, promoting racial justice and equity. A lot aren't interested in that kind of stuff. So this tells you there's more than meets the eye here. Um, well, simply put, if you've read this document, you understand why Black Lives Matter would promote on their website as they do a lot more than racial equity and racial justice. And you'd understand why they try to make those things synonymous. And there's so much concern if you look at who Karl Marx is and where he comes from. So first, my first point, I think I made this already. I want to make it again. This, we have to be careful and define terms here. Let's not change the dictionary definitions and make a new modern vernacular where black and white means some kind of ideology and, and randomly spin it. From, non -cla from classical definitions to a suit a modern vernacular and then change terms like some kind of morphic ball whenever we have a political movement uh, uh, we want to advance. When people say black, they typically mean skin color. They typically mean African descendancy um, and different textures of hair. They mean things that are, uh, as the Christian would say, part of the flesh, they are not saying it with reference to black equals Marxist or, and this, this becomes an issue. We have weird attempts to stretch the current English definitions and modern understanding and vernacular. Um, and Daniel Joseph spoke about this. Okay. And what we read is this, white does not mean white. White and radical uh, parlance, parlance uh, means anyone of any race, creed, nationality, color, sex, or sexual preference who embraces capitalism, free markets, limited government, and American traditional culture and values. Now, there's more we're going to cover here, but you have to let this sink in. Where white doesn't mean white. We're not, when, when we hear the term racist, that you're a racist or white privilege, and we'll get into that in a moment, all of these things, it doesn't mean what you think it means, where inside, in your heart, you actually hate 
people because of the color of their skin. Or you, you hate a black person simply for no other reason than, well, you're black, so I hate you. Understand, there is a communistic nomenclature that has absolutely successfully been implemented. And this is it. It's, it's, it has nothing to do with being white, but white is a term referencing a person that believes in democracy, that believes in the American dream, that believes uh, we have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That's what being white now means. It gets better. The philosophical concept belongs to Noel Ignatiev. Now, if you haven't heard of this guy, this needs to become a household name at this point where we're at in this country. Nolan Ignatiev, a white American of Russian origin, he's actually a third generation communist. You need to understand that. Who is the ideological founding father of numerous uh, radical black movements in America. Now, you want to know what the ironic thing here, and he just recently died. I want to say a year or two ago. Um, Noel Ignatiev is white. Okay? He has a Russian descent. He is white. And yet he's known for numerous radical black movements in America. The author of this concept was even lucky enough to see his best students, Black Lives Matter, in action. So when Patrice Cullors comes out, and, and we, we clearly with by her own admission, declaring they're trained Marxists, you got to just keep peeling this back in, in what form of Marxism were you training? Or what kind of ideology have you been filled with? And the name you need to understand is Noel Ignatiev. And his goal and his focus, look at this. And then you can look at, look at what's happening in this country right now and go, oh my goodness, you cannot be serious. This actually has successfully been woven. Going on. Research into the work of this former Harvard professor. There we go again. Is it again? Is it a coincidence that we have this septic tank known as Harvard uh, producing more communists? It's it's a communist producing factory. I mean, this is what it is. And so, and, and bright minds, highly intelligent, but. Look at what's happening. Research into the work of this former Harvard uh, professor finally answered the question of why BLM proponents are so negative about the perfectly rational slogan, all lives matter. If you've ever seen this, I mean, that is the death of anyone who's going to attempt, you want to wear a shirt that all lives matter, you must want to die right now or be set on fire because culturally right now, it is not allowed. It's not accepted. You even have, uh, I think it was Walmart, right? Taking, having, being forced to take these shirts off, off the shelves and not being able to sell it. Amazing. Well, listen to this. The fact is that the black in the interpretation of Ignatiev is a revolutionary Marxist. Are you following this? To be white... In Ignatius' mind, in communistic mindset, a modern-day communistic mindset is to be pro-America, pro-democracy, pro-life, pro-liberty. To be black is actually means, well, you're a comrade. To be black means you're part of the market, Marxist ideology and what Marxism stands for, which one of, again, one of its core tenets is total destruction of morality. There can be no distinguish or line between good and evil that must be destroyed all those who do not agree with the left ideology should according to Ignatiev be eliminated and this is what I'm telling you there's no alternative anyone who comes against the communist ideology must be put down you must be destroyed according to Ignatiev black is not the level of the pigment of skin in the skin, but the level of adherence to the Marxist doctrine. Okay, so you got to you gotta be introduced into a new nomenclature of terms. All right? It was he, a convinced, uncompromising, and resolute communist, who in 1967 proposed the doctrine of white privileged. Not as a racial term, but as somewhat modified Marxist term of the class struggle. 
The notorious eradication of white privileges is simply the standard Marxist wealth redistribution expressed in new speak. You ever wonder where this term, I mean, it's almost like, because I've talked to people and they're like, where does this stuff come from? White privilege and all this like animosity and, and hatred and, and being boiled down. And, it, and this is, I'm going to tell you, listen to me carefully. In this culture that we're living in right now, it don't matter if you're white or if you're black. There's a video of a black guy holding the American flag, walking around proud to be an American. And the crowd went absolutely ballistic, both black and white, calling him a racist. He was a racist. He was a bigot. Just all these derogatory terms. You know why? Because in Marxist nomenclature, he's not black. He's white. He's a racist. See, everyone that is not going to follow the Marxist ideology is a racist. This is why you have all these people calling Donald Trump a racist. He doesn't hate black people, but he's a racist. Let me, let me, we'll unpack this even further. I want to show you a video and, and it pretty much sums, sums it up. Welcome back to our Democratic Debate Special. Before she became a United States Senator, Elizabeth Warren was a professor at Harvard Law School. Very impressive. She was the first tenured professor of color, you'll remember, at Harvard Law School. So she's a researcher. She's got an academic mind. It's not surprising she's been able to discover countless new forms of racism permeating American life, kinds you've never heard of before. She listed them last night during the debate. Listen. We need to call out white supremacy for what it is, domestic terrorism, and it poses a threat to the United States of America. We live in a country now where the president is advancing environmental racism, economic racism, criminal justice racism, health care racism. Well, she's a lot of fun. Uh, the question is, what is she talking about? What is health care racism, for example? What is environmental racism? Well, Tucker, I can actually answer that question for you. I mean, here you have Elizabeth Warren, which, uh, again, isn't it interesting? Where is she from? A uh, Harvard. Yeah, you can't make this stuff up. And apparently, we now have these items called uh, economic racism. See, it's called capitalism. It's called free markets. It's called reaping what you sow. But that's racism. We have environmental racism. Apparently, we have healthcare racism. Do you, do you understand what healthcare racism? Pay attention to what she's saying because she absolutely is a card carrying uh, Marxist. Come right out of the, the, the doldrums of Marxist uh, breeding grounds, the septic tank of Harvard. And her nomenclature, all of it makes sense as a communist that these are all racist because they don't, capitalism doesn't work. Uh, free. Uh, you know, free health care as Marxism supports socialized medicine. If you're against that, if you believe in private health care and being able to choose your provider, you are a health care racist. Do you understand how this works? And so we're dealing, uh, they've hijacked the English language. I don't know how else to say this. This is what's happening. Now, continuing on, look at, look at this, what this says. The goal of destroying the white race is simply so desirable, it boggles the mind trying to understand how anyone could possibly object to it. And again, you would think that Noel Ignatiev, being a white, is talking about killing all the white people in the world. That's not what he's talking about. Communistic terms, anyone that's going to embrace white privilege, which is to say, capitalism the american dream one of his videos but where for example you had um some pretty radical groups of muslims saying black lives matter is our matter where they're basically trying to equate in, in a very real way and, and not even stretching what they're saying here that black well now the religion of islam becomes black and if radical Marxist is defined as black, that is not the correct usage of the term black uh, when it's re with reference to humans. It's It's been a term of skin color and African descendancy. It has, it, 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 
to grab onto the term and redefine it to some political movements and religious movements and all these other things that it wants to promote, uh, which it wants to portray as minority views in accordance with a Marxist agenda, that's not what that means. So we have to be so careful and understand, sure, of course, black lives matter, but what is the founding ideology behind the movement, the greater agenda? Because this says a lot more than equalizing of races. So let's, I'm going to pull up some documents from, uh, pull up my books really that I've written on the topic. And let me start with the history of Karl Marx a bit. Um, and they're just the most brief history possible. Um, just going to scroll down. Um, so here's a quotation from my book, Observational Commentaries on Social Atheism, Volume 1. Um, without a doubt, Karl Marx, um, this fellow here, who is largely responsible for the development of communism is alongside Darwin, Charles Darwin, a few others, Charles Lyell and Julius Wellhausen, and probably Sigmund Freud, one of the foremost advancers of societal atheism in all history. We will speak of Marxism, Marx's communism in the following volume of this series. However, at this time, we cover a brief background. Um, so according to a document from Stanford written 2003, you can See this at uh, https uh, double slash uh, plato.stanford.edu slash entry slash Marx. Um, Karl Marx is best known, uh, quote unquote, not as a philosopher, but a revolutionary whose works inspired the foundation of many communist regimes in the 20th century. It is hard to think of many who have had as much influence in the creation of the modern world. Trained as a philosopher, Marx turned away from philosophy in his mid-twenties towards economics and politics. However, in addition to his overtly philosophical work, his later writings have many points of contact with contemporary philosophical debates, especially in the philosophy of history and the social sciences and in moral and political philosophy. Historical materialism, Marx's theory of history is centered around the idea that societies rise and fall as they further and then impede the development of human productive power. Marx sees historical processes, the historical process as proceeding through a necessary series of modes of production characterized by class struggle culminating in communism. Um, to go more to Marx, and remember, Marx is, this is where we get the term Marxist and Marxism. It's from Karl Marx and it's with particular reference to the communist uh, agenda represented in the Communist Manifesto. Um, another quotation from the same document, um, Marx or Karl Marx uh, was born in Trier in German Rhineland in 1818. Um, although his family was, was Jewish, they converted to Christianity so his father could pursue a career as a lawyer in the face of Prussia's anti-Jewish laws. A precocious childhood, Marx studied law in Bonn and Berlin and then wrote a PhD thesis in philosophy comparing views of Democritus and Epicurus, these are ancient Greeks. Um, on completion of his doctorate in 1841, Marx hoped for an academic job, but he had already fallen in with too radical a group of thinkers. There was no real prospect. Turning to journalism, Marx rapidly became involved in political and social issues and soon found himself having to consider um, communist theory. On many of his early writings, four in particular stand out. Contribution to a critique of Hegel's philosophy, right? Introduction on the Jewish question were both written in 1843 and published in the Deutsch uh, Französische Jahrbücher. Uh, the Economic and Philosophical Manuscripts, written in Paris in 1844, Thesis on Feuerbach of 1845, remained unpublished in Marx's time. Excuse me for a moment. Um, so the place and time is exceedingly important for understanding Marx. He's from Germany. Um, he lived from about 1818 to I think 18, 
was it 1883? I'm, I'm probably remembering it wrong. Um, let me pull up a not so great resource, but your emergent, yeah, 1883. So Germany, 1818 to 1883. First thing you need to understand that this Karl Marx, whom Black Lives Matter follows, is a Caucasian man in a country with a profound history and strong history of racism against Africans and, and other people from a time that is very controversial, a time period when certain developments would lead to some of the most vitriolic forms of racism against black people, against Africa, those of African descendancy that have ever been known to man. Now, I'm not saying for certain that was all this man's ideology, but if I came from an African background, African-Canadian, African-American, I'm going to immediately be concerned the moment I hear Black Lives Matter identifies itself as a Marxist movement because it's tying itself to a person who's more rich in Caucasian history than black history. And that means there's a lot of information to deal with that is not going to be covered in your education from common um, Black History Month um, narratives. I'm, I'm going to be concerned with this if, if I'm from that culture, if that makes sense. And there's, there's a lot here to look at and to investigate. Um, I have read this document. I've critiqued this document. And I will tell you there are some very serious issues with it. And if you can really look at the history of Marxism or the history of communism and read this document with a critical view, not somebody just accepting it as some infallible truth by default, just because your professor who is sort of like your parent to you, who you, you're affectionate with them, uh, just repeated it to you as, as if it were true. If you actually sort of get outside of your emotional um, ties and just without bias as much as possible look at it, you're going to see some very strange things. Now, I'm going to mention something I will not cover in this video. I'll make multiple videos with multiple parts, probably. Marxism has a history that is not necessarily as pro-black as it seems. And I'm going to get into the backbone of Marxism in a moment. We're going to look at one of the most important parts of this document. But first, I want to turn to a page of this Communist Manifesto that is going to help you understand why people tend to look at communism as an anti-racist system that sort of solves the issue of racism. So in Chapter 4 of the Communist Manifesto, they have this statement. The proletarians have nothing to lose but their chains. They have a world to win. Working men of all countries unite. And obviously it says working men of all countries. It does not say working Caucasians or working white men. Working men of European and everything but Africa unite. Um, it nowhere defines, as far as I remember, working men to be purely Caucasians. And people are going to say, well, that has a humanity unifying statement that abolishes racism. Well, they're quite accurate in the sense that in a very real way that does. And that would be a beautiful thing, except working men of all countries unite for what? And if, I, if this was all I read of the Communist Manifesto, I'd say this sounds great, except unite for what? For what ideology? For what system? And you're going to understand that this has a lot more in it than a statement of racial equity. And if you research it, 
thoroughly, you find issues with it almost right away potentially exist. Now, one of the other things I wanted to point out that's so critical, Marxism has had a history I might I might be repeating myself here. Sometimes I lose track of myself. Please bear patient with me, patiently with me. Marxism has a history that in many ways undermines the interests of the preservation of the sacredness of African descendancy and black lives. And this is something that is real and tangible and I will speak about it in an upcoming video and you can read about this in my books. I have a three volume series called Observational Commentaries on Social Atheism and in volume one I speak about the relationship of Marxism with a certain other ism that has been very problematic for um, black people and I'm about to talk about that in these videos too though probably less in depth. Um, if you're an African Canadian, African American, and maybe you grew up in a public school education system, and and I I want to say this that you know you could be in two groups. You could be in a group where you completed your education, or a group where you dropped out. And my brother, for instance, he dropped out uh, due to stresses of bullying around grade eleven. Um, so I'm not saying this in terms of particularly picking on statistics relevant to the black African um, Canadian and African American communities. It's just dropping out is a relatively common thing under the stresses of the current system. And it, it even it even reaches Caucasians in, in, in more ways than just from suffering from bullying or anything of the sort. It's a very complicated issue. So first thing I want to draw from, from my past what I ha experienced in Lester B. Pearson Collegiate as somebody who would ultimately graduate, although not right away because I finished my grade 12 education in 2008, but I had actually um, failed the careers course just because I, I had no interest. I didn't even at that time, I did not want to think about what I was going to do with my life. I, I had no idea. Uh, so um, at the time I took that and I kept procrastinating finishing that credit till about I think it was 2010 I finished it through correspondence so um, I was pretty much done everything by 2008 but I didn't officially graduate till 2010 but I did graduate with my whole grade 12 education and I went through pretty much the route of the applied courses and so for those not uh, remembering the literature very well applied it tends to be seen as the hands-on level of education it's generally pictured as something less noble though maybe it shouldn't be i think that's kind of arrogant and um or pictured as less competent and again i think that's an arrogant statement to say um and uh people in the applied courses uh the idea is that their post-secondary education is college but there are those in the academic and what was later developed called the enriched courses and those in the academic and the enriched courses these are your 99 percent students the sort of role model students and the idea is they're the university qualified bunch and they're going to go to the universities and that's a higher level education and these are your philosophers your mathematicians and statisticians and your intellectual elites who we could never compare to from the applied um, they would go to first the academic courses that's what they call it this classification of a higher tier of education so for example you could have grade 12 math and you have grade 12 applied math grade 12 academic math and what they teach is a little bit different um, academic is more advanced later they made this term called enriched which is like a slight level above academic it's even it's for somebody who's sort of ahead of their time I don't think there's any shame if you didn't go to that. I think probably a lot of that education now is overrated in certain aspects, maybe not, probably not math and computer science, but other things, but uh, like history and philosophy. 
I have serious questions there now based on what I've seen. But what I'll tell you is if you were in the applied stream in the very least, it's guaranteed if you were born around 1990, um, you probably were taught virtually nothing about communism. And what you learned in your textbooks is insufficient. Um, and that's just a fact. It, and I, I would even go further to posit the belief that I think that information was intentionally withheld from us to te turn us into pro-communist promoters who promote a ideology we've never personally read or understood in depth. Um, the other thing I, I quoted these terms, so I, I mentioned that a lot of us, we ended up graduating out of high school and Oh yeah, so so if you dropped out though, if you're like um, one of those common group, and this is applies to all races, where you drop out maybe grade ten or eleven, just it, it's too much stress, and it didn't seem like this was relevant to your life. Uh, sorry, not this. Um, like um, the school system was really getting you anywhere or serving you. Um, you need to understand first that's a very common thing, but if you dropped out that early, it's it's guaranteed you you definitely don't know the past of communism. There's just no way you would, because I, I went through the whole system, I and I didn't even know, and nobody talked about it. If they do talk about the Communist Manifesto in high school, it would be in perhaps in the academic courses or the enriched courses, but it was not in the applied courses talked about. It was only in the sense of the my teachers in political um, science classes and things of the sort, um, world issues, did not read this document to us. I'm kind of glad that they didn't. I doubt they would have given an honest reading of it or really explained what it's really saying and or a view that is unbiased and not critical of it, or, or sorry, that is critical of it. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of glad that they didn't anyways, but um, we we hadn't we had no idea what this document says. So, if you're in that group from African Canadian African American background, coming from me a Caucasian obviously person, but somebody who's grown up in that same system, understand that if I say you do not know, it's very probable that you might not know what it means to be a Marxist to say. We have a Marxist ideology as Black Lives Matter's co-founder as. Don't take it as an insult, but take it as a legitimate concern that you might not know the whole story. And again, uh, you know, don't think that this has anything to do with some kind of racist, untrustworthy opinion. I'm looking to lure you into some kind of system of oppression because... First things first, this is a Caucasian man, very relevant to Caucasian history. I don't really have any point lying to you if this man is not being promoted in a favorable way for me. Um, this would be this would be one of my homeboys, if you were to use that term. I come, I have an Eastern European background. Um, my uh, mother's family fled to Canada. Um, as orphans from World War II, um, my mother's mother came from Ukraine and Russia, that type of area, who fled from the same circumstances generally. Um, and my grandfather was from Poland, uh, her mother, uh, sorry, her father, and um, he was orphan, an orphan from Poland when um, Germany was bombing them and attacking them, um, and they fled to Canada, um, but not after, right away from some time. Um, her father, uh, my grandfather, was uh, uh, adopted for a little while into a, a Nazi family, um, which is a very ugly thing, and make no mistake uh, by adopted I don't mean like fully accepted that he was sort of he had a very rough past they would beat him and sort of use him as kind of a farm slave labor it was a very ugly thing and end up turning my grandfather into kind of a very cynical not 
kind uh, type of person, but um, he fled to Canada and whoever survived of the family as well. But um, so for me, this is really a locale uh, right next to Germany and next to nations, you know, Ukraine and uh, with its attachments to Russia, and which has generally had a communist history in recent times. This is somebody who would hit very close home to me. Um, my father's side, I identify, would be more closer to British lineage and Irish, and they were sort of in Canada since the 1800s, but um, even in, in British and Irish uh, people, uh, the literature of these German philosophers is, is very known um, because you want to consider that at 1800s, Germany and England are very close um, to one another, not just in terms of landmass, but in terms of their relationship of the uh, intelligentsia, as they're called, the intellectual elites and the philosophers. They go to and fro from England to German, all, Germany all the time, and they have skilled translators, and many were bilingual. A lot of English could speak German as well, um, the language of Deutschland, and and vice versa. So um, these they had things in common, and that bleeds over to every Caucasian European society. So whatever was popular in Germany in 1800 was popular in Canada and America and pretty much everywhere Westerners were. Um, so this literature is, is quite known to our people and our history. Um, so at any rate, before I get into the specifics, uh, some of the specifics of this document, I want to talk, tell you that there is a backbone principle of this document, this communist manifesto, this Marxist manifesto, this creedal document of anything that ide identifies itself of a, uh, as a Marxist ideology that is so important to understand. So I'm going to pull up my fourth book, Observational Critique and a Copy of the Communist Manifesto. So this is an in-depth quote and reply point and counterpoint critique on the Communist Manifesto and then it contains the freely available copy from Marxists.org. Um, just so that in the back, just put that in there so people could cross-reference and see that I wasn't making stuff up about what the Communist Manifesto says and they can freely download that from the website or buy their own copy from Amazon like I did. Um, so first, the Marxist literature has a principle that is their background principle from which all other teachings of it draw. And a lot don't understand that. If you read this document in a purely chronological order in the sense of starting from, from page one to the rest, um, you may fail, and I'm not saying there's anything, that's the normal way to read, but I, if you're just skimming through and thinking you're going to understand the document, when you read it through two, three, four, five times, as I have, uh, you start to see that there's one principle that feeds every other principle in there. And that appears around chapter 2, page 26, and depending on the version of the book you use, and by version I don't mean translation so much, as um, this issue I dealt with. So this is the copy, the physical copy I got from Amazon, and they have a digital copy at Marxist.org, and they're basically identical, but one has a different uh, sort of text size for the font, and that changes the number of pages. So a, I could say something's on page 224, uh, chapter 24, and you might look that up in, in whatever copy you have and say, that's not there. Well, then it might be page 26 or some other page. Uh, so the page number is not always going to be consistent depending on the text size, but um, and which which is referenced at the time. So um, when I started writing my book uh, and my critique on the Communist Manifesto, I did it mostly with this particular copy that you can get from Amazon. Um, however, later I started using the Marxist.org one as well, just because it was easy for quoting from. I could just go um, look, do a search for this phrase I was remembering, copy paste the portion and quote it in my document, put it in italics with the quotation marks and 
um, that ended up causing some confusion in terms of which chapter and page reference is sort of different but that's the only explanation for it it's there's no they're they're all reading the same um, so at any rate um, the core principle of the communist manifesto of the Marxist literature from which they draw their definition of who they are is a principle that ap appears on chapter 2 page 26 of the communist manifesto and it reads accordingly undoubtedly it will be said religious moral and philosophical and juridical ideas have been modified in the course of historical development but religion morality philosophy political science and law constantly survive this change there are besides eternal truths such as freedom justice etc that are common to all states of society but communism so he's saying this is what the opponents of communism say and so something you want to understand if you've never read the communist manifesto these terms frequently appear bourgeoisie and proletariat your most simple explanation and layman term definition of what that is is bourgeoisie is basically your your rich capitalist business owner and landowner and factory and warehouse owners and that's what the bourgeois and the bourgeoisie is and when they use terms like bourgeois society they're referring to the the rich of the earth if you will the wealthy capitalist uh, especially they word this with a view to America in particular referencing the finding of Americas and stuff um, of the sort but uh, the proletariat are the proletariat are basically the um, the low wage earner they if the modern proletariat would be minimum wage workers uh, so if you're like me and you started with an agency a lab a general labor agency like just labor or or manpower or something of the sort and you start with your fourteen dollars an hour or whatever it is and then you spend about um, maybe uh, let's calculate I'm just thinking about it quickly you probably spend about half your monthly earnings on your rent alone and things like that you're you're you you'd be qualified as the proletariat of our time basically it, it's basically minimum wage earners um you know the the sort of low class of society as they would view it um that's the most layman general generalized definition um of course you'd understand the communist manifesto was penned in uh, was published in 1848 and penned around that time so you would want to do some historical research into who the differences between the wealthy of our time and the wealthy back then and but also understand that Marxists rarely make that differentiation most Marxists only a very explicit few in other words if we said the modern capitalist is more makes an environment of a workforce that's less oppressive than those living in 1832 for example that's a possibility but most marxists don't make that discernment they they just repeat the narrative of the manifesto with a view to our modern times and say nothing's different um which may not be exactly true and it might it may be true it, a lot of things may be similar i'm not going there that's not typically the point I argue that much but it is an interesting thing to study but um, point being most Marxists don't make that differentiation at all um, nevertheless so when you hear that term bourgeoisie and proletariat understand bourgeoisie is to them the wealthy business owner that you and I will typically work for um, and most of us don't like that modern work environment very much um, you know when especially with the RF scanner technology and the way people are pushing quotas and it's like if you don't get 400 cases picked in a day you're assumed that you must be playing a, uh, games on a cell phone in a bathroom somewhere uh, if you're frustrated with that type of environment you're the type of person Karl Marx would want to recruit into the proletariat revolution um, nevertheless Chapter 2, page 26 of the Communist Manifesto has a portion that reads, 
quote, undoubtedly it will be said, religious, moral, philosophical, and judicial ideas have been modified in the course of historical development, but religion, morality, philosophy, political science, and law constantly survive this change. There are besides, besides these, eternal truths such as freedom and justice, etc., that are common to all states of society. So when he's saying it will be said, he's saying the bourgeois opponents of the communist narrative. Now here's what he says, but communism, in other words, but Marxism, or you could say but Marxists, or but communists, these are synonymous terms, but communism, it says, abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion. It abolishes all morality, instead constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradistinction to all past historical experience. Now, I know communism has a history of loving to ally uh, radical Muslims. For example, Vladimir Lenin quotes from him prove this irrefutably in certain religions when it's convenient for them. Following Muslims and uh, communists and it reads Bolshevism, which is communism. It's, if you're not familiar with uh, Vladimir Lenin and the Bolshevik Revolution back in the early 1900s, it's literally through that the czarist regime, the, the Russian regime, fell. An entire nation fell to communism. So Bolshevism became an attractive alternative to many Muslims who flocked to the new organs of government being built by the Soviet regime. Lenin stated the socialist revolution will not be solely or chiefly a struggle of the revolutionary proletarians in each country against the bourgeoisie. Now, again, the proletarians, these are the, the, the revolutionaries, these are the communists going up against the bourgeoisie, which is what? The bourgeoisie is the middle class. I'd like to point out something interesting. Who's getting hit the hardest in this corona lockdown? that's being forced upon us. Who's being hit the hardest? The middle class, the bourgeoisie is being wiped out right before our eyes. Businesses are going out of business that will never come back. Small businesses all over the place. Oh yeah, but Walmart's thriving and other big corporations and industries, they're, they're, they're gonna survive this, they're gonna be fine. But the middle class is being destroyed. And so continuing on, uh, it says no, it will be a struggle of all colonies and countries oppressed by imperialism. In other words, our struggle is everyone's struggle against freedom, against liberty, against democracy, or what they would call imperialism or colonialism. So by imperialism of all dependent countries against international imperialism, the Bolsheviks welcome left-wing Muslims into their ranks, and as a result, approximately 15% of uh, the Communist Party members were Muslims in parts of Central Asia. Now listen to this. Bolshevik leaders issued a call for a holy war against Western imperialism. Again, I tell you, the traitors wear the face of the arguments of their counterparts. In other words, the Bolsheviks went out, the communists went out and said, your war is our war. It's a holy war. They speak the language. They're speaking uh, radical Muslims language. And they begin to link shields. You would think something incompatible as communism and Islam could never, ever come together. But the irony of it is, is they are brother and sister. It's, it's crazy when, when you think about it. Now, it goes on. Lenin asserted that it was necessary to support Islamist movements under conditions in which they contested local ruling classes, colonial control, or both. In other words, Lenin says, we'll link with the Muslims so long as they're contesting the local ruling classes. So if you have in America right now Muslims that are not satisfied with American democracy and our ruling government, the communists will go in and say, you're not satisfied with it. You need to rise up against this. Well, isn't that interesting? Because that's exactly what's happening. You sh we should have Sharia law here, you know, etc. And so continuing on, uh, 
this astonishing alliance was defended by Lenin with great vigor against those who believe that communists should have no dealings with religious activism. In other words, the writers are recognizing historically there were communists that opposed Lenin's whole vision here that we need to include Islam uh, in this matter, at least specifically with only within the context of destroying a nation. Keep that in mind. Uh, and communists are like, we don't want to do that because communism is anti-God. God is the enemy of communism because communism is a work of the devil. I mean, this is not, you know, rocket science. Continuing, he argued that it was vital to persuade such movements in the colonial world that their future lay with the workers of Europe against the imperial powers and that a dual approach was required. In other words, what he's saying, Lenin is saying, guys, if we actually want to accomplish to take down colonialism and imperialism, we're going to need their help. We need their assistance to be able to infect the entire world with communism. And so he recognized this. And so as long as it's in the context of, you know what, the goal is the same, they can get along. The moment that changes, it's over. And you will find communism being a rabid enemy against those Muslims. Continuing, we read this. Look at this headline. Palestinians rage riots planned across the U.S. align with George Floyd protests. In other words, BLM. Now, I'm showing you this headline recently because the very thing historically that happened in the early 1900s, open your eyes, it is happening again this unholy alliance is taking part and we can there's many many other headlines that i could show you where people are recognizing what's going on and going this is this is insane but it's happening that you are powerful you can in 2016 you can change the reality of our time your vote your negotiating power in the year 2016 Turn your centers, Islamic centers, mosques, into registration centers for voters. Black Lives Matter is our matter. Black Lives Matter is our campaign. Basically, you are the new black people of America. If we don't stand, you will see Muslims murdered in the streets. We are the community that staged a revolution across the world. If we could do that, why can't we have that revolution in America? But the general truth of com the purest form of communism would not tolerate religion. Uh, you could basically say communism abolishes Christianity. So if you're a black Christian, you might want to understand what that means when you're hanging out with Black Lives Matter friends. And if they're loyal to that ideology, most probably don't even know about the Marxist uh, literature, but at least the founders do, and they're loyal to it. Um, it abolishes Islam. It, it, the purest form of communism, the purest form of Marxist ideologue would abolish Islam as well, and Buddhism and Hinduism, and all morality, instead constituting them so again, it reads, but communism abolishes eternal truths. It abolishes all religion and all morality, instead constituting them on a new basis. It therefore acts in contradiction to all past historical experience. Chapter 2, page 26 of the Communist Manifesto. Um, I would contest various statements here. I don't think it's that, that it acts like it's this new thing. It's, it's not really that particularly new. A lot of the ideas of the Communist Manifesto have been implemented at some point in history. You'll find in some historical societies in one form or another. Um, I, I believe you'll find that. Uh, Paul B. Skusen argues this in his book, The Naked Socialist, and it's he has a very good point. I think I'm in agreement. I see no reason to object to that. Um, uh, as well as, you know, abolishing morality is nothing new. It's not an 1840 thing. 
and this is classically something that's happened at numerous points in societies and we can then look at ancient societies and say whether that turned out good or turned out bad but um it, it's just morality is a thing humans tend to have struggle with because it implies moral standards and laws that are all universally agreed to that are binding on things we do anything from how we conduct ourselves financially how we treat other people how we conduct sexuality and any number of things um it's very strange to just say we abolish it though um it's it, 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 it may not be the most new thing ever it, it is something I want to take away from this, but you need to understand the implications here. But first, the most important point is that it says it abolishes eternal truths. We have to ask, what does eternal truths mean? Because I think there's a huge problem with the Communist Manifesto is that it, people who are reading it, who are sort of in a rush, keep assuming they know what that means and they hear the word eternal truths and they immediately think religion because um, religion talks about eternity it talks about the afterlife this is not necessarily what the communist manifesto means and that is not necessarily the pure implication of the term nevertheless so this statement from chapter 2 page 26 of the communist manifesto and i'll explain what i was saying in a minute um, we can call this the Holy Trinity of Communist Doctrine, the most basic principle and teaching of the whole manifesto upon which every other thing in it hangs, the preeminent principle of all Marxist literature and the source of all its authority. For the critic, there's clearly a lot to take issue with here. There is a lot abolished in that statement to, to potentially complain about or discuss. But the first implication eternal truth is the sore thumb standing out more than all here and i'm just quoting from my book observational critique and a copy of the communist manifesto uh, continuing there is an incredible danger that the average reader will glance by this statement and say, sort of say okay moving on and not really grasp what is being said here in the statement there's so much that needs to be considered First, we could say this is actually the root for all other abolition texts in the manifesto. It is frustrating that people, even those that come before it in the chronological order, those that appear in chapter one and various abolition statements are the manifesto, abolition of family, abolition of private property, etc. The root of all that is this principle in chapter two, page 26, even though it might come later than some of them, it is the mind of Marx and Engels that they're drawing from. It is frustrating that people have a habit of reading eternal truths with a sense to a purely religious ceremonial connotation as if with reference only to a divinity creator or a word of God, etc. And that is why they tend to glance by or skim and ignore this text without thinking and meditating on it more deeply. That issue is that that is a matter of issue in itself that is in their abolition narratives however eternal truth is a far more encompassing term than something of a, a, a religious ceremonial nature with reference to a god or a deity it goes even into a the atheistic world and to all world views the implication of using this wording is far greater than anything of a mere religious connotation if you can understand this which you should, a lot of the modern applications uh, that we're seeing in various socialistic movements will make a lot more sense what they're drawing from. And you'll see that they're drawing from Karl Marx. They're drawing from the Communist Manifesto. Even those who don't necessarily call themselves Marxists or communists or dream for world communism, but just socialists, many of them are drawing from Karl Marx uh, in various ways. You have some that are more um, thorough in their Marxism, more um, loyal to the manifesto agenda. You have others that are partial Marxists and sort of don't like the extremism of some of it, but they they rely on a lot of it. Um, regardless, there this is the the language they're drawing from. I want you to understand what it means when somebody says we abolish eternal truths, because again. Black Lives Matter founders have said they have a Marxist ideology. The Marxist ideology says 
It abolishes eternal truths. What does that mean? Let me help you understand this with a picture story. So imagine a man, um, and this is just a theoretical story to give you the sense of what, what becomes the possible and this is not a stretch of the interpretation what I'm about to read to you. This is this is literally its direct implication and what kind of happens in a very real way. What the example I'm about to give is a typology, meaning that as a literal word for word example, something like this may never happen in your life, but things almost identical to it or like it in very numerous senses are happening daily. Um, so here in this example, picture in your head a man, an adult in his late 40s with a gray beard and a scholarly look. And this is an accomplished man with PhD achievements, numerous degrees, a gentleman and a scholar, if you will, an intellectual elite, an esteemed man, a reputable authority from a university like University of Toronto, a professor. And this professor, he comes before you holding in his hand an apricot. That is the the fruit of the apricot tree with the pit in the middle and you eat the flesh and you typically throw away the pit uh, with the light yellowish color. He's holding an apricot. Maybe he has it in his right hand. Maybe he has it in his left. That doesn't really matter much. Now he begins to make motions with this apricot in his hand as if he were a child imagining something. Uh, that it wasn't an apricot and picturing something in their head as if he's enacting a dog fight which is an aerial combat situation between two fighter jets and this 40 year old scholar with PhD achievements just move maneuvers this apricot around in his hand and he starts making sounds with his mouth and maybe has two apricots and he's moving them like they're fighter jets moving around and he starts making missile firing sounds and jet fuel propulsion sounds with his lips and his tongue and he's maneuvering them around and just like your your four-year-old child does when they play um, games with their imagination he mimics the sound of last resort machine gun fire when the missiles are expired and maneuvers them towards each other and then he takes notice of you and he stares you dead in the eye completely seriously and with jubilation perhaps even he declares holding this apricot in his hand and he looks at it says this he looks at you he looks at it he says this is the most advanced the best in the world version of fighter jets today this is the f-22 raptor and he continues in a childlike fashion to go back to enacting a, a fight between jets, making all the sounds like a child would, imitating these things. Now, what is your reaction? Classically, you laugh at something like this. You laugh. And why do you laugh? Well, because instinctually and intrinsically, you know in perfect understanding that the scene is really absurd. It is ridiculous. It, it must be a joke. He's playing around is your first assumption because why would an esteemed scholar in his late 40s with numerous achievements act like a child and pretend that an apricot was a fighter jet? This must be some kind of a joke um, that to pretend an apricot is anything other than an apricot or a peach or a, some fruit like that. It's ridiculous. Um, so you laugh at the man, you think he's trying to make you laugh with some kind of absurd act. But as you laugh at him, he replies in a way you'd never expect. He looks at you and his pupils constrict and he's angry. He yells at you, how dare you laugh at me? Do you know anything what you're doing? My team and I worked diligently to prepare this F-22 fighter jet from the ground up. It took us many years and great research. And you exclaim to him, kind of confused, but that's a that's an apricot. And he looks at you and he says, "What? Are you mad? This is a this is the F-22 Raptor. Are you touched in the head? This is a fighter jet." All the while, he's holding this this little fruit, this apricot in his hand. Now you see, 
normally this type of conversation is ridiculous because we know intrinsically an apricot is an apricot, the fruit of a tree, a consumable, and you could not even make a fire fighter jet hull with the with pieces of hard pits from apricot many apricots glued together, let alone the flesh. It would not produce anything stable like that. And an F twenty two Raptor is a fighter jet. Um generally produced in America, a highly advanced and complicated aircraft with numerous components and a multi-billion dollar investment. They're, they are not the same, and there's no way to call an Apricot an F-22 Raptor in, unless you're either out of your mind or you're a child in your own world or, and joking, but no serious person would say that. Why are they not the same, though? And this is where the modern philosopher tends to go asking these questions. Why can I not say that an apricot is an F-22 fighter jet. Why can't an apricot be an F-22 fighter jet? Well, normally it's ridiculous to even ask that. Do we even need to ask? They are not the same because it's an eternal truth. And now you'll see where I'm going with this. It's an eternal truth that an apricot is not an F-22 Raptor advanced fighter, next generation fighter jet. It cannot be a next generation fighter jet no matter how much you try to word it, spin it, and sell it. And you see the implication, or rather the unavoidable realization of factual material life is that there is a law of true and false in the universe. Now some do not like that word law because the moment you say law, where do laws come from? And we have other laws, by the way, discovered in the realm of science. You hear this term law of gravity. I jump and I come down, I jump, I come down, I jump off a building. If it's big enough, the gravity, the law of gravity plays and I'm gonna come crashing down and I die. Um, there's another law called the law of true and false. And it exists in the universe and you can observe it, it's in your daily life. The reason people don't like the term law is because laws don't make themselves. Legislative bodies create laws. People write laws into existence. And if I have a law in the universe, it highly implies that there is somebody who wrote that law into existence. And this is where we're often forced to concede the probability of a god or a creator designer of the universe. And people don't like that because they don't like the idea of authority over them. So first, that's why most people don't like this terminology, but it's just a fact and you can observe it. And I'll define this a bit more for you. Um, the the implication or the unavoidable realization of our factual material life, as I said, it's the law of true or false in the universe. Why do we laugh when a grown man and a scholar believes an apricot is a fighter jet, no matter how much he seriously believes and is convinced of it? Well, because he's just simply wrong and he really should know better. There's no debate that he's wrong. No sane person debates that he's wrong. It's barbarically embarrassing of a scholar in his late 40s if he thinks that an apricot is a fighter jet. And we expect more from our children uh, age 5 to 6. And that is what you call the universal law of true and false in effect. If I hold up an apricot or a peach or a banana, I say, this is such and such a fruit. This, I, If I hold up an apricot and I say, this is an apricot, that is a true statement. It's true that an apricot is an apricot. If I hold up a banana, I say, this is a banana. It is true that it is a banana. But if I hold up an apricot or a banana, I say, this is a fighter jet, or this is a beautiful woman I want to marry, or this is a this, this is a that, no, it's false. It's it's a lie and a false to say it's anything other than what it is explic explicitly what it really is and it's defined as. And it's a simple observation and an unavoidable system that installed into the network of the universe. There are, is a law of true and false that is ir irremovable and irrevocable. There are absolute truths, eternal truths. And there are false statements, and these two can be differentiated from one another and are differentiated from one another. The very basis of all modern and ancient intellect and scientific advancement and advancement of mankind is the fact of a universal law of true and false existing in the universe by which we differentiate one matter from another matter. 
Thus, that is the way we are, that's the basis of the scientific method um, to test hypothesis, uh, hypotheses and like we can test and falsify and therefore do science as long as we have a system of true and false. You can't falsify anything if you d delete ob objective reality and delete eternal truths and abolish them. And we see this differentiation in numerous literatures of origins, origins of humanity and origins of the universe of both a religious and non-religious nature. For example, the Bible begins its creation narrative, the, the history of the origin of humanity in the universe, with separations and labeling. Um, God creating heavens and earth, and the two are differentiated from one another. They're not made the same and making different classes of existence. Um, Darwin's atheistic origin story on the origins of species contains also terms of differentiation and separation. Um, if you eliminate that concept, all intellectual information, value, and advancement is destroyed in one fell swoop. Everything is completely devalued, and all sense really just becomes nonsense. And this brings the issue with the statement, communism abolishes eternal truths, which can alternatively read, Marxism abolishes eternal truths, and therefore the loyal and the, the true Marxist, who calls himself a Marxist, abolishes eternal truths. To abolish eternal truth is to abolish the very concept of differentiation. The universal law of true and false, and the basis of all wisdom and intellect and human learning and word definitions from the first human pair to our present time, and by consequence, it is to leave room for really numerous and countless developments that are truly a practice of insanity, such as a man lying to himself to convince himself that an apricot was somehow a fighter jet. That's just a lie, and you're lying to yourself. The statement, we abolish eternal truths, really opens the door to what I like to call insane philosophers, men who will achieve degrees and become professors at universities, uh, look really intelligent and have positions of authority and say simultaneously in the midst of a bunch of educated lingo things that are just flat out absurd and foolish and childish and, and just wrong. A grown man, a male, can say, a human male, grown man, can say he's a baby female dolphin if we can abolish eternal truths. You're not a dolphin, you're a human being. You're not a female, you're a male. And you can never be a female dolphin. A man who decides he wants a convenient way to rape a woman, if it, that system's in play, can identify as a woman, go to the woman's washroom, rape them, and then it's, it becomes easy for him to exploit the system. A man wanting to murder another man can beat him to death, identify as an extraterrestrial visitor disguised as a human, and make up a constitution for another civilization where that's legal, and say, you cannot punish me, I am not under this jurisdiction, I'm under the jurisdiction of Mars, and you have to come to my planet and contact my authorities if you want to persecute, prosecute me. Um, a person can eat human flesh, cannibalism and identify the, the flesh, the human flesh, as hot dog made of chicken. Everything becomes subjective and absolute cease to exist and nonsense follows and the worst type of lying imaginable becomes popular. Uh, becomes popular and this becomes all the more worse when people become hypersensitive to offending other people. Nobody wants to tell the madman that he's, he's a madman. This, what I'm telling you, is not a stretch of the usage of the statement in Chapter 2, page 26 of the Communist Manifesto, which is a fundamental basis from which it draws all its liter literature and authority. This is exactly where we have these modern instances, scenarios like these described. For example, a grown, you know, there was this famous story recently, and it, it's a true story of grown Caucasian man, and rather sizable one, and in his, I think it was in his late 40s, and he, did not even shaving off all his facial hair, made his hair into pigtails and put on a pink dress, and he was convinced he was a, um, 
a little girl. But he's not. His genetics say he's not. His appearance says he's not. Fact and sense says he's not. And the law of true and false says he, he's not. It's false to say he's a, a little girl. But, you know, if I ab abolish eternal truths, why not? And that's your problem. Um, so these are not a stretch of the usage. That's actually where this is coming from. It's coming from Marxism. Another statement that's a good example of this, when people say, if I was to say something happened in history, and this is, let me give you an example where we're going to commonly interpret and in, in, in encounter this kind of stuff. So if I'm a Christian and people keep demonizing my religion with the story of the Crusades, and there are some terrible things that actually happened in the Crusades, like the persecution of Jewish people, without a doubt, but... People keep making this narrative of Christians attacked Muslims and just attacked everybody. And I look at the history books and even Islamic scholars like uh, Islamic historians like Al-Tabari and, and the Quran and various literature. And I find Muslims attacked Christian empires before Christian empires attacked Muslims in the history book. And now somebody says... Well, you're an Islamophobe, and your sources of history are borked. They've been tampered with. The victor always writes what he wants history to say. This is an abolition statement. This is abolish eternal truths. It's, this is when people conveniently change history to be whatever they want it to be when they want to promote a teaching or a religion or a philosophical movement or a political movement. And when people act as if there's no reliable history recorded anywhere, there's no way to know what's really true. There's no way to know what really happened. The victor keeps changing the story to suit their thing. Which, by the way, it's that's just flat out not true 100% of the time. Um, oftentimes, if you read the works of ancient historians and don't ad adopt this insane narrative and then keep saying, well, I don't even know that that guy really existed and really wrote that, this is where it leads to. It leads to people being ultra skeptical of the things that are actually intellectual and sensible and being not skeptical of mad stuff like a guy saying he's a female dolphin um, but you know the victor writes what he wants it to say that's not always true we have plenty of examples of historians such as Tacitus and and various others who they wrote some unfavorable things about their own societies they they sometimes they criticize their own society like tacitus is a roman historian he documents for example the brutal murder of christians and as if boasting about it you know he called christians haters of mankind and that sounds a, lo a lot like our modern time and but interestingly in another place he is not very proud of Rome. He says Rome is where everything hideous and shameful finds its center and becomes popular, but he's a Roman historian. Um, so historians don't always write some propagandic, totally propagandic work. At times, portions may be propagandic. At other times, portions aren't. And sometimes their work really is unbiased. So why do we have people who say there's no way to know what's really true about history because people change the history books to suit what they want? That's not even true. Um, but if I abolish eternal truth, I, I, I take away all learning and intellect and study of history and nobody can learn anything and come to a sensible conclusion. Um, there's no way to know about the universe, what's really true. That's not true. This is why science... The scientific method has been developed so we can test things. Ideas can be tested, and not all ideas are equal. All, all I believe earnestly, all human beings are equal um, in the sense of equity, but not all ideas are equal. Okay, just like you might have one guy make something like this, this Arctic air air conditioner and to say this is equal to every other arctic air conditioner and value that it's 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 as worthy as being the product you use to cool yourself is not accurate there's better inventions out there and if i have the better invention i don't need the lesser invention i'm not saying there's lesser people but 
people don't have to identify as their philosophies and ideas. There are superior ideas of how humans should conduct themselves, and there are inferior ones that are not worthy of continuity. That is just a fact of life. That has nothing to do with racism. That's just a simple fact. Uh, if somebody were to come tell most of you, you know, it's a very healthy idea for you to follow the ph the philosophy of this great philosopher called Ronald McDonald, and you, you need to eat Big Macs every day. You'd say it's a very unhealthy idea. It's a bad idea. And it is. But... Now this guy can have a counterpoint if you abolish eternal truth. Say, no, it, it's it's health. Why can't it be healthy? What objective data can you really present that's really trustworthy? And I don't believe, and then you present all these health statistics. And he's like, but that's not trustworthy. That comes from an anti-Big Mac culture. That's ridiculous. Um, this is what you're talking about when people make this kind of statement. However, there's a second implication very much related. So again, communism or Marxism abolishes eternal truth. Chapter 2, page 26, Communist Manifesto. To understand this second implication is simple enough if you just ask some questions. So what is the opposite of truth? Because if I abolish, I'm by opposite... I'm going to establish the opposite by consequential nature. Something will fill that vacuum. The opposite of truth is false. So if I abolish eternal truth, I sort of establish lying or, or falsehood. Or I should have not used that word so early. I abolish eternal falsehood, if you will. But the, the other word which I just used for false is lying. Uh, when somebody says false things people who abolish truth they say false things false stories which is what you would do uh, if you abolish truth uh, we call them a liar and the opposite of truth is lies if the communist manifesto literature abolishes eternal truths if the Marxist manifesto literature abolishes eternal truths then by consequence it establishes the permissibility of falsehood and lying and also the permissibility to market and portray falsehood and lies as a as truth, as a philosophical moral system, so as to make all truth subjective and therefore no truth at all. And unfortunately for them, truth is by nature objective, and it's not subjective and opinion-based. Um, that means in the system of communism, there's just no foundation for truth. There's no foundation for accountability and honesty. But there is a foundational platform to make lying permissible. And communism, Marxism are inter synonymous terms. They're interchangeable. Um, are humans like Marx likely to lie if it suits a political agenda that they personally have a lot to gain from? Absolutely. Why, why would you assume not? So now your question becomes this. If this abolishes eternal truths, and this is a foundation of all Marxist literature, and this is a foundational point of all their theory comes from this one point, we abolish eternal truths, they're basically establishing it's permissible to lie then. What does that say about the rest of the Communist Manifesto? What does that say about Marx? What does that say about Engels? What does that say about movements whose co-founders are saying we have a Marxist ideology? What does that say about the other books Marx wrote? And he wrote a lot of books, by the way. Um, what wise and educated person trusts a liar is the question. If I had a politician, and this is especially going to be the case with a politician, let's just say I had the People's Party of Cappadocia, and they have this politician named... And I'm just making this up, but uh, Greg Jerry, and I hope there's no Greg Jerry, a famous politician of anything. I'm just making a name up. But this Mr. Greg Jerry of the People's Party of Cappadocia says, well, you know what? I want you to vote for me. I want you to trust my ideological system that I want to install in your government. And I want to change your national constitution 
to suit something superior. Constitution's flawed. It's racist. By the way, I'm a liar, and I lie to people, and I am a liar because I abolish truth, and to abolish truth actually makes me a liar. But you should trust me because I'm not really a liar, though I am a liar. And you should let me tell you how to live your life and let me rule your country. As That's ridiculous. You're not going to trust that guy and vote him to power. Nobody's going to... Because liars... If he says, I'm a liar, what he's really saying is, I'm not going to keep my promises that I make to you. I'm going to make false promises and say I'm going to deliver you an Edenic utopia, a, a miracle, beautiful, miraculous, beautiful, peaceful society, and I'm never going to ever del deliver that reality to you. If communism or if Marxism abolishes eternal truth, that means potentially every single last narrative, every time this document from which they're drawing says, this is how life is, this is how this is, this is the history of this, it could potentially be lying. And it could be a to total work of fiction. And in fact, it's not enough to say could be, which is obvious consequence of just existing as a document written by humans. But And everybody picks at religion. They pick at, say, the Bible should be like that or, or Quran should be like that. Why not pick on this? Because if, this, if you're going to say this is a document written by human hands, it's, as so many people are opting to say that uh, they want to assume that there's no divine word in something like the Bible or, or the Quran or anything like that. And I'm not pro Quran anyways, but why would that not apply to this? Why you're telling me this is truth. We abolish truth cannot be truth. So by abolishing truth, Potentially every single narrative in this, not only could it be a lie, it has a high probability of containing lies. Because there's no accountability to the value of truth in communism, in Marxism. That already, that statement hurts the credibility of everything in this book, everything in the movement, and therefore everything in the founding roots of Black Lives Matter. Um... And the Communist Manifesto, therefore, just refuses to be accountable to truth. No liar remains credible if his lie is exposed, if, if it's questioned hard enough. In the court of law, even a good actor can put up a convincing act, but with enough pressure, the truth comes out readily enough. I'm just quoting from my book here. but So, let the intelligent and thoughtful readers of the document read this with a critical view and, and take notice of these things. And that's important. Um, again, if the Communist Manifesto, if the Marxist Manifesto has outright stated its agenda abolishes eternal truths, why would any sensible, intelligent person take any take this document seriously at all? Because it doesn't value truth. Why should I trust it? Why should anyone trust it? Why should a black person trust this? which is obviously not even written by a black person. This is this is a Caucasian guy. Um, there's no reason to trust it. It's, it's established the permissibility of lying. Um, in one statement, this document absolved itself of all loyalty to the foundation of all human intellectual pursuits, the system of differentiations of labelings, the universal law of true and false, a, an eternal existent law which is just unavoidable, and therefore he who establishes the manifesto as if trustworthy or even infallible turns all order to chaos and all sense to nonsense, and they open the very depth door to the very depths of insanity itself. That's your first problem with this, and therefore Black Lives Matter, because the Communist Manifesto is really saying truth does not matter so much. The agenda of the party is everything, even when it is proven to be not true or shown to be not true. Um, that So every story where the manifesto is selling you a narrative of human history is potentially a lie and needs to be tested. So I want to contrast this issue for you. And by the way, do you know what the manifesto says about Christianity, about the religion and the Bible? You know, there's this popular meme that comes up, Christianity, white man's religion, and this and that. Do you know why they're saying this? Because this is 
the modern communist lingo to make people not read this book, uh, the, the Bible, and not read documents like it. Um, in the Communist Manifesto, it claims that religion, with a particular view to Christianity, is a ambush behind which bourgeois interests lurk. In other words, they're saying it's an ambush for rich white capitalists to exploit people in the modern Marxist vernacular, but in his time, not many people cared about black people to begin with from that locale. Uh, became an increasingly common problem. So he's talking more probably with a view to white um, wage workers in a, a factory or a warehouse. But I, I give him the honesty of chapter four, but it's not uh, that unity of chapter four isn't very valuable if it's bound by other principles that might undermine its its beauty. And there's absolutely principles like that in the Communist Manifesto literature that make racial equity, yeah, but equity into what system? Um, if you don't ever study the Communist Manifesto, you might be in for a surprise of the reality of what kind of a, a system these people promote for your government. Um, and I'm going to clarify that more in the coming videos. But I want to contrast this w this way. The Jews and the Christians and those Judeo-Christian groups who have pres preserved the texts of the Bible, uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, and they hold this, their creedal document, just as the Marxist draws their personal identity from this document, Jews and Christians draw their identity, Jews from the first portion of this and Christians from both portions, uh, from the, 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 the Bible, from the Torah, the Tanakh, um, the Pentateuch, if you will, the New Testament, the New Covenant, the writings of, uh, of the life of Jesus. Um, that is the defining literature for Jews and Christians. Um, Jews, not so much the New Testament, but still, we have a common basis here. This religious literature reads very different from this document, which just says we we abolish eternal truths and we don't value truth. And therefore, you can lie and do whatever you want and say whatever you want to manipulate people to get what you want. Um, the Old Testament, New Testament doesn't read that way for those who are religious. Um, for example, Leviticus chapter 19 from the from the Christian Bible and Jews have the same literature. It commands the community: do not steal, do not lie, and do not deceive one another, and do not swear falsely by my name. So profane the name of your God. I am Jehovah, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now, this is binding literature for both Jews and Christians alike, and that's infallible that, you know, people try to promote this theology that a New Covenant, New Testament, Old Testament abolished, that's not consistent biblical interpretation. Anybody who competently reads the book from start to finish will never hold that position that that's what's affirming. And the, the New Testament quotes from the Old Testament so much that that's really an erroneous position. Um, though the details are somewhat more complicated in the context of a new covenant, but I'm not going to get into that right now. But point being is that Jews and Christians are commanded to not lie or deceive one another. And for Christians, it gets even more intense. Um, in the Christian worldview developed from the biblical literature, there is an afterlife after you die. And there is a creator God who judges you based on the decisions you make in life and the creeds you affirm and the beliefs you profess with your mouth. And if you did what is right and correct in God's eyes and not in your opinion, but in God's opinion and correctly listened to his words and discerned what were his words and allowed him to work that into you, if you submitted and obeyed him, in the Christian literature, you have the hope of resurrection into immortal body, a, a second 
after you die receive an immortal body superior to your current body in which you get to live with God forever basically and enjoy the Eden of the Bible if you will the the paradise but if you're hostile to God and obviously the Communist Manifesto is hostile but I, this is not with issue to anyone's particular belief right now. I'm just saying this is factually what Christians believe, what their their literature affirms, and you're going to see why this is relevant. Um, if you did not, in the Christian belief, do what is right and pleasing in God's sight, your eternal future is to be resurrected in a, to an eternal mortal, a mortal body similar to what the group that pleased God gets, but for a different purpose. Um, and you get sent to a different place called the Lake of Fire, a place of, and I've read all the manuscripts and, and the ancient Greek readings and the, the translations of them, and it really reads as a place of eternal torment, place of eternal torture. And not, you know, people say separation from God in, in a sense, yes, but really it says they're tortured in God's presence. The very God who is the God of love and God of creation these people are so opposed to every definition of what God truly sees as love and truth and justice that they're appalling to him and they become an eternal anathema, if you will, an accursed thing and subject to eternal endless punishment that is justly deserved. I'm not saying you have to like religion or like that idea, but just stop for a second. Think, think what that means for a Christian. Now, here's what Revelation 21.8 from the Bible says. But the fearful, the unbelieving, the abominable, the murderers, the whoremongers, the sorcerers, and the idolaters, and idolaters includes greedy of gain and abusive rich bosses and all kinds of things. But And now it says, all liars shall have their part in lake of fire, which burns with fire and brimstone, the second death, and, which is the place of eternal torture. So if I'm a Christian, first, if I lie... According to the first half of the book, I risk offending God, and if I offend God, he could he holds my breath in my hand. He authorizes when I live or die. I could die before my time by offending God, by adopting a lifestyle where lying and abolishing eternal truth is popular. I'm not saying this with mocking reference per se to communists, but abolishing eternal truth, basically abol establishing lying. Um, however... The next part of the book, the New Testament, is taking it further for the Christian. He's saying, if you lie, your afterlife is to be tortured forever. Now, I'm not going to apologize for what the text says. I'm going to say, now think, if I'm a Christian and I believe that, am I likely to tell you intentionally a lie? If I really believe that and affirm this, Christians don't say this and not believe that. Most Christians really, who are, are are biblically literate, really believe this. Who now? I, I now I'm going to ask in contradistinction. If I have a religious bourgeois or a communist, who's more likely to lie to me? A person who's afraid of going to eternal torment and hell for lying is obviously less likely to be telling a lie than a person who just says flat out, we abolish eternal truths, therefore making lying permissible. And they didn't say therefore make lying permissible, but that's the natural consequence. So what I am saying is, in contrast, I would expect to hear far more truth from a religious bourgeois who binds himself to creeds such as these, namely a Jew or Christian, than I ever would expect to hear from Karl Marx or the Communist Manifesto or a communist or a Marxist, which is basically a communist. The communist convinces themselves that there is no truth and abolishes themselves of all personal accountability in accord with Marx and the Manifesto. The Jew and the Christian, on the other hand, are terrified of breaking the commandment of lying, uh, 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 commanding them to not lie or and deceive people as a lifestyle as a lifestyle of habit and way of life. That's not at all to say Christians and Jews never fall short of their own commandment and don't break the commandment lie, but who is more probable to have 
more honesty more of the time. The person who values not lying and values telling the truth or the person who just abolishes truth and doesn't really see the, a difference between anything. Well, if I hear a Jew or Christian say, by the way, there's this ugly, murderous, evil history of communism and Marxism and when it was practiced in this and this locale, and this this place, this and this happened, and this has consistently happened, and the story is a disaster, makes communism and Marxism looks bad, and makes you never want to vote in any political party attached to something like Black Lives Matter. Well, I'm going to have to say the Jew or Christian are more likely to be telling the truth than the communist who says, don't listen to that. that that's Jewish and Christian propaganda. That's fake. Who's more likely to be telling the truth? The person who values truth or the person who who just says we abolish it and makes way for insane philosophers. So the first thing I'd have you take away with in this video, and we're going to we're going to get more in depth in this in the following parts is be careful what you're affirming and supporting and understand that if you're throwing in your lot with a Marxist movement, it is a movement with a high view to communist manifesto revolutionary action and by revolutionary we're talking revolutionary armies people take up guns and fight against governments and change the government system to the communist system and there's two forms of takeover of that an intellectual takeover subverting public school systems and popular media and then the the other system is to well, just brute force everything with guns and bombs, and then and then you do that afterward. But um, you have to understand if 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 you've never studied this, if you've never studied communism and Marxism, if you haven't studied their history, and you're just going off of the basic stuff you received from public school, you receive basically nothing, and you you probably don't understand what the background of that movement is. And I'd I'd ask you to take it seriously when a Caucasian person with a Eastern European background is telling you I wouldn't necessarily trust this Eastern European guy to be my leader. You have a movement saying it's interested in the well-being of black people who's basically making by making Marxist literature your ideology, you're basically saying, this is my leader. This is the leader of my party. This is my defender and protector. First, look at his skin color. And that this is a depiction, but look at all history. And I, I sure hope nobody starts Photoshopping because when you abolish eternal truths, and if I'm a Marxist, Black Lives Matter founder, and I don't like that people are noticing that Marx is not black and he's Caucasian, and maybe I don't want them to think too freely, so maybe I can just Photoshop him and sort of add some braids in Photoshop to this hair, and I can turn him into a black person. And it's easy enough if I abolish eternal truths, and why can't he be a black person? He, look, he's a black person. Here's a, here's a black Marx. This kind of stuff actually happens you laugh if communism subverts the governmental system in america and in canada they are liable in such a way that they have no strength of opposition anymore what they are liable to do is to change your history books and if it benefits them to change the skin color of Marx and they find some way to control all the internet servers and do that and not look bad, they actually might. So be careful what you affirm in history. 